Um, wonderful. Good morning to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Now, um, the first presentation um, compared to the previous presentations yesterday will be much more specific. That's the, that's the good news. Now, I'll be saying something about the experience um, we have in terms of the steeper approach angle of 3.2 degrees, and I hope that that's going to be a successful presentation for you and myself. Now, where are we at the moment? Now, in terms of active noise abatement, so therefore I'll be talking about modified flight procedures. Um, this picture, however, is not um, suitable for explaining the difference between 3.0 and 3.2 degrees. Now, you've seen this uh, picture in different versions yesterday. Um, still, I'd like to just uh, come back to that very briefly um, by just enumerating the most um, uh, the the biggest um, so sources of noise, um, the lift system, engine flaps, and the gear. Um, even though the noise generated by the slats and flaps and the engine gear um, depend largely on speed. Now, the engine's uh, noise depends greatly on the thrust level or the engine speed, you could also say, and the thrust level depends on the flight path I'm required to follow. In addition, overall noise depends on the altitude above ground And in order to design um, the noise-relevant flight procedures, um, you need to take all these factors into account. Now, this is a chart that shows the design process for noise abatement procedures. That's a, um, a stage by step-by-step -step process um, that starts by doing a noise calculation and assessment of um, operational feasibility, um, and then we, um, after the performance calculation, do a fast time simulation. Once you've done that, um, you can go on to a, the full flight simulation stage. Um, so you tried uh, to um, analyze the flight in a simulator. Um, and followed by that, um, you do flight testing. And um, afterwards um, comes the operational implementation. So um, integrating that into the um, ordinary flight procedures um, associated with the noise abatement validation, so assessing the actual noise levels. Now, um, these design processes have been applied to a variety of projects over the last few years. Um, let me just um, point out um, two projects that we had in the beginning. Those were called um, quiet air traffic um, that we had in the beginning. Then we had a national uh, project called um, LANAP, which um, translates into noise optimated um, start and approach procedures um, and then we used the Lufthansa and uh, ZFB uh, fuel simulators um, and did quite some intensive testing with the A330. Um, and then we had a study request from Fraport um, called um, Stenam, um, which translates into a steep final approach. And um, those are the projects I'd like to um, refer to. In the um, LENA project, uh, we used an A319 at the Parchim Airport um, for the flight testing. Um, and now we are in the test phase um, for the 3.2-degree um, angle um, that we had embarked on as part of Stena. So I don't want to, you to be under the impression that um, this um, only resulted in a 3.2-degree finding. Now, the results um, of these various programs have been quite diverse and were also um, integrated in some additional projects. Now, 3.2 degrees, why to 3.2 and not more? Well, um, our research has shown that 3.2 degrees is the limit um, up to which you can fly the aircraft without 
um, for instance, uh, changing the deployment of flaps, the gear, etc. But this only holds true for the A320 and the A330. That's the uh, types of aircraft we use for testing and validation. Now, 3.2 degrees um, leads to a higher height, 246 feet. Um, before starting the continuous um, descent, um, but it also leads to something else. It's a later stage of configuration because you um, fly laterally for a longer period, period of time. Um, so um, a um, last thrust in the final approach because uh, the angle is steeper, and then also a later increase of thrust in order to stabilize the aircraft. Now. Let's look at the geometry for the Frankfurt situation on the, nor uh, the new northwest runway. So um, we used several measurement points um, for the um, 07 left um, approach, uh, three measurement points, um, and then uh, five for the 25R approach. Um, so. They're in different um, areas, um, and the difference in altitude is between 40 and 60 meters on the left-hand side and between 60 and 80 meters for the right-hand side. Now, how did we introduce this 3.2 degree approach uh, in Frankfurt? The Northwest runway is only certified for so-called precision approaches. Therefore, um, we have a redundant ILS system installed, um, which basically makes 3.2 and 3.0 degrees possible simultaneously. Um, and due to the results of the Shena study, which is um, a safety and operation study, first and foremost, all the stakeholders involved um, agreed to do a um, CAT1 test phase of one year um, involving the 3.2 degrees. Um, so I think it's it's uh, it's over now, that one-year test phase. Um, and the Federal Ministry of uh, Traffic then also um, authorized this test phase, and we started on the 18th of October 2012. Now, the DLR Institute of Flight Systems then um, accompanied the study and, um, and assessed the results. Uh, normally, it's not our task to do so, but as we had been involved in the project from the very beginning, we also were willing to um, support in that regard. Now, had I known how much work that would be, I don't know whether I'd say yes again. Now, starting from um, October 2012 on to May 2013, the DFS offered 3.2 degrees um, as a, an approach angle, and the pilots were asked to either accept or decline. After May 2013, up until the present day, this option did no longer exist, because um, if the pilots weren't willing to uh, fly the 3.2 degree angle, they had to um, go to another runway. Um, now, DFS then also monitored um, the 3.2 degree cases, um, so took records of when the aircraft came down at a 3.2 degree angle and when it did not. And then uh, Fraport and um, UN, uh, UNH then also um, provided those measurement stations, uh, three on the left and five on the right. And then at the measurement point called Lechisberg, um, we did visual checks in order to see whether the landing gear um, had been deployed or not. And then also, um, lastly, what I said earlier, we then evaluated um, the noise um, levels and the flight path and then tried to put them in perspective. Now, use, using the 3.2 degree angle, um, you can see here um, in terms of the percentage points, 
DFS, for instance, uh, did not um, offer 3.2 degrees in certain weather conditions. So 3.2 degrees are only flown under Cat 1 conditions. Um, so in the beginning, it was 60 percent, then a decline also maybe due to weather conditions again here in uh, from April to May. Um, but um, it uh, increased overall from 60 to 80 percent almost um, in July. So we only have data up until July of this year. Now in terms of acceptance, acceptance on the part of pilots. Um, this acceptance um, rate was quite high. Um, in the end, only um, 0.2 degree, uh, only 0.2 percent of crews declined. And um, in the very end of the test phase, the acceptance rate had increased even further. I believe Lufthansa no longer reports any declines for the 3.2 angle. Now, in the in the test phase up until now, there were no safety-related incidents, which is also an important point to take into account. Now, this is just um, some uh, an overview of the data volumes assessed um, up until um, the start of operation of the 3.2 degree angle. So we had. Um, different volumes for different measurement points. Um, there are certain measurement points that we only established at a later stage, uh, which obviously didn't make it easier to assess the overall impact. So before the start of operation, so that's um, the reference data. And then that's the 3.2 degree test phase in between the blue lines. Um, and in addition to that, we also had um, radar data available and um, then also um, data for 3.0 or 3.2 degrees, um, so basically lists um, that told us what angle was chosen. Uh, we don't have any cockpit data. We tried to get that in the beginning, but unfortunately that didn't work out, and that obviously made it very difficult to evaluate the findings. Now, onto the measurement points. Um, they're not always directly below um, the flight path. So three on the left-hand side, five on the right-hand side. The findings I'm going to present to you in a second um, are structured according to this rationale. So that's the number of approaches um, assessed. And then you have the measurement point 208. That's the identification for the measurement point, And then 203 for that. Um, and then you have the runway here in the middle. So the, the um, aircraft is approaching either from the left or right. Of course, the distances are not, um, are not correct. So. That is something you've already seen. That's the overall result. For instance, 44, measurement point 44, uh, Lechersberg, almost, almost 88,000 um, data sets. Um, and then obviously the one, the 208, that was established at a later stage, um, um, less um, data available. So um, red for um, uh, 3.0 and blue for 3.2. It's a simple statistical evaluation that basically um, records the maximum medium sound level. And this is due uh, to the fact that the standard deviation, this, that's the standard deviation down here, and that's the means. So the maximum, the minimum, um, maximum, minus minimum means and standard deviation across all aircraft, so no differentiation. So those are the different charts. And when looking at this one, for instance, you can see, um, okay, that's the blue bars. Um, they're lower than the red bars. Um, the difference, again, is depicted over here. And when looking at these respective measurement points, you will see for yourselves um, that there is um, a decline that is even 1.4 dB, even um, um, also more than one for those two, but also some, um, some um, lower differences. Okay, now those are the means and the difference to the means. And when you just do a theoretical analysis, uh, you have two um, different types um, of um, of perspectives, uh, so a geometrical dampening, as we call it, um, and uh, a theoretical one. So, 
the geomedical um, damp damping should be um, 0.56 dB at all measurement points. In addition to that, you have an atmospheric damping, which is very difficult to to ascertain because that is due to the current weather conditions, in particular temperature, um, but also the emitted frequencies, and they can be very different uh, depending on whether you the landing gear has been employed, whether um, I um, I uh, deploy the flaps, um, etc. Um, so this was an assessment um, or. A, an estimate, and if, for instance, you um, you, ha you apply 15 degrees Celsius and 70 percent humidity and 2,000 hertz, um, and um, and put in the atmospheric um, damping that um, adds to the geometrical one, I'll come up to that geometrical um, damping. So um, it's it's a very rough chart. So I just um, use that for illustration purposes. So here I got more and here I got less. Why? So you have the number of data sets depicted here. Um, so uh, measurement point 208 um, provides rather a limited amount of uh, reference data sets. Um, and that's the total number. So 424, no, 4, 4 million and 2, 424,000 data sets. I'm sorry. So um, what is specific about those two pictures, um, this one shows the maximum sound level above the distance at the point in time when that maximum sound level was recorded. So um, you also have the means uh, depicted here as well. Now here at this measurement point, um, the um, special th thing about that is that there is a threshold uh, for that measurement point, and obviously, um, if you are trying to assess a um, noise degrees and um, you have values below that and therefore the measurement point doesn't detect it, so that is why certain measurement points were difficult um, to handle. We also try to um, to um, complement that mathematically, but it's very difficult and also difficult to explain now what happened at the other, me uh, other measurement points. Now, this one provides more than expected. Uh, those three, almost what we expected. But those two um, over here, um, they provide a lot less than we had expected. And those are the two ones that we had um, just outside of Offenbach. Um, now, if you look at the altitudes um, or the, the angles, um, whether they actually flew at 3.2 degree angles, you see a distinct um, difference um, to the um, angle applied. Um, so um, over here, um, in terms of the angle, um, the altitude is much higher, uh, much higher than what we had calculated calculated geometrically, and that is due to the fact that maximum sound level um, is not emitted when the um, aircraft is directly above the measurement point, but just before that, and that's due to the characteristic of, um, of noise sources. So um, you can assume that it also matches with the altitudes, and then we uh, try to uh, calculate the speeds, and that's another effect. Now, um, when using the 3.2 degree angle, um, aircraft become s more, more s uh, become slower. Um, I'm just going to exclude this one because we have very um, few reference data, but, but it's around 8 dB, but not um, here on these measurement points because um, that's just um, slightly um, before the final approach. Now, we also analyzed the, um, the deployment of the landing gear. I told you that was a visual check we did. Um, and in terms of that, we found out that when using a 
2.2 degree angle, 10% of aircraft already have the uh, um, landing gear out above the Lechus back. Um, and for the 3.0 uh, degrees, um, it was 20%. So that means the landing gear is deployed at a later stage, which also, again, has a uh, an impact on noise emissions for measurement point 44. Now it gets a little complicated because I picked out two extreme cases, two extreme cases for 3.0 um, and 3.2 degrees, um, and um, I used measurement point 44 for this analysis. Um, those two extreme cases, even though it were the um, aircraft was at 3.0 or 3.2 degrees precisely, um, uh, differ by t 12 dB. So at uh, 3.0, you have a difference of 12 um, dB, and for 3.2 as well. I mean, these are extreme cases, I told you, but what is that due to? When you look at um, the speeds, uh, you can see that um, the noisier ones, uh, the 3.0 and 3.2s, um, had uh, 40 knots more in approach. What is that due to again? Uh, when looking at those two flight paths, you'll see that the noisier ones are CDA approaches. So out here, less noise, but in here, because of the speed profile, more noise. So, you know, they use CDA, um, but uh, they reduce speed at too late a stage. And this can lead to such distinct differences. Um, when looking at the issue I referred to earlier, and that is um, the measurement point um, 203 close to Offenbach, um, you can see uh, that even though there are differences um, in altitude and both altitude and speed, you have the same noise level in the end. And this, again, can only be due to the fact that very different procedures um, are, are applied in those flight, flight paths. Um, so the thrust differs. Maybe the landing gear has been deployed already. Um, we cannot, um, we cannot uh, definitely uh, confirm that because we lack the cockpit data, as illustrated earlier. Now it gets even more complicated. Um, why? Because this is the frequency distribution, um, and this is um, also um, a, an assessment we did. So we used the data and did a frequency co uh, distribution analysis. So we have some normal distribution. So that's the black curves. That's the normal distribution um, that we use um, using the means and the standard deviation. Um, but of course, we also have the um, Oberat measurement point. That is the measurement point 45. And you can see some um, some uh, cutoffs here in the lower um, on the in, in the lower levels. And you can also do the same thing with 3.2 degrees, obviously, and then compare. And that's the important thing. And you see that the um, frequency distribution um, moves to the left um, almost at all measurement points. Um, not here in Offenbach, but here at the Goetheturm in Lechesberg. Um, and um, the frequency distribution moves to the left, as I said. Now, there is another type of analysis, noise abatement, um, because um, of the means um, getting smaller and frequency distribution m moving to the last but left, but also um, the shapes differ. Um, so in Offenbach, the noisy uh, aircraft uh, become uh, less, which again uh, results in a um, noise reduction. Now. We also tried to group aircraft families. So we have the um, Airbus family, um, the uh, 737 uh, MRR, um, uh, the um, 332, 343. So Airbus almost 50% uh, for the uh, 318, um, 320, 321. Uh, so. Uh, you can just compare that and see at different different measurement points, the different um, aircraft groups also provide different results. So you cannot say that Airbus is um, less noisy or Boeing is louder. Um, so you have different results for different types of aircraft at every measurement point, basically. And then we have an LAX. Um, f uh, 
statistic um, study, that's the single um, event level. Um, so we'll have the, the, the presentation um, passed on to you, so that's why I'm going to leave it out. Um, on to the conclusions. Now, um, the uh, current uh, 3.2 degree test phase can be regarded as successful. Uh, it shows high rate of acceptance by the pilots. No changes in operation that have a detrimental impact on the noise levels, no impact on safety either, and a noise abatement between 0.5 and 1.2 dB. And that's only the measurement points that are relevant. So um, not all of them, because I already explained that some of them should be disregarded for the reasons I explained as well. Um, and the results from theory and the safety studies do now have been confirmed. Uh, and at the measurement point Lechesberg, um, we measured more noise abatement than expected, and that this may be, and uh, we don't know for sure, this may be to lower speeds and also the landing gear being um, being extended at a later stage. And at the measurement points in Oberrad and Offenbach, we had not reached the, the results we had expected, um, apart from the fact that the noisier aircraft become less noisy, um, but um, no major differences in the means. Now, the reasons for that will have to be identified and uh, therefore we need to do more research in that into that now on to the future work um, we still have to assess data from the last three months so we'll probably have that available within the course of next month so that's one thing and then secondly we also need to find out why the um, means have not been reduced as distinctly as expected in Offenbach so that was it thank you very much Thank you very much, Dr. Kunish. As you had already mentioned, um, we'll have um, a conference folder um, and we'll make all the presentations available. So I didn't uh, watch time too strictly, so only a little, um, only a little bit of time left for questions. We have a question over here. Um, thank you very much. I'm from uh, Morfen uh, Waldorf. I'm not affected um, by um, departures, but by approaches. I've been involved in this um, for a number of years, and let me just put it bluntly. Now, in terms of the means, not the extremes you showed, um, is that you know, just reinventing the wheel something? Because you made, you put in a lot of work. Um, and um, the question we always ask is, um, you know, uh, changing the uh, slope and then um, you have 0.5 to 1.2 dBs. And um, this is something that's difficult to detect um, for the human ear. But we make a lot of fuss about the angle, you know. I'm just, I'm, I'm thankful for the work you've done, no doubt about it. But, the, you know, put the, the work put in, the efforts put in, and the results that come out, you know. If other factors um, have an impact, um, and you clearly illustrated that um, for the maximum um, dB de reduction, then I'm asking myself why the fuss about the um, slight difference um, in slope. Um, and then also the CDA story um, about, you know, um, that becoming noisier. This, again, is another um, important component of active noise abatement. That's just my first impression, really. And I'm just asking myself, um, w is the effort put in worth the result? And apparently, it's very limited. Um, when, um, when, when looking at the effect on noise perception, it's rather limited, right? Now, on to the first part of your question, efforts put in and the results, and whether that's, um, w whether you, th whether that's um, worth the results. That's a question that you shouldn't ask me, but someone else. On to the, um, the other points. Uh, the fact that we have other levers that uh, might be more effective uh, the, other than uh, to increase the angle by 0.2 degrees is a different issue. And this is something that we'll look into in future as well. 
So we're currently um, working on a project uh, by Fraport, uh, which is um, um, about speed management in order to um, to prevent these extreme values. We had a question in the back as well, and please wait for the microphone. Um, now, what do you think the possibilities um, are when it comes to um, achieving the 40 decibels um, established by the WHO, what's the contribution your study can make? Unfortunately, I didn't hear the question. Can you repeat that? Um, so the WHO um, issued night noise guidelines uh, referring to 40 decibels um, as a measure for um, a health impact. Um, and you make a contribution to noise abatement. But um, how many percentage points are left in order to achieve the um, WHO noise guidelines? And um, how much have we achieved with the studies you've done? Now, the studies or the evaluations um, all re, um, related to maximum sound um, levels and individual sound levels, and unfortunately, um, I cannot respond to that question. I, I, um, I wouldn't know how to answer that. Okay, another question here in the middle of the room. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Uwe Kruger. Um, we are of the association Cockpit. So we represent about 8,000 pilots that are employed with um, German Airlines. and. I would consider us a stakeholder in this project. So we were involved in the project as a stakeholder. I wasn't involved personally, so I don't know everything. So um, we still have to wait for the final assessment, the final evaluation of findings, because we don't have all the findings yet. But um, we're supposed to ask questions, not make statements. So therefore, let me ask the following question. Um, in the beginning of your presentation, you said um, that you related to the A320 and the A330 and your initial findings. But these approaches were also done with the um, A340 and the A34600. And um, the A340 um, and the A330 are very different different types of aircraft, that doesn't come as a surprise to um, all of us. So was that uh, covered in the initial um, analysis? Um, so um, I um, did these types of approaches um, um, for the A330 um, and the other type of aircraft, and I declined um, these approaches. I declined because um, this only basically um, referred um, to the wind conditions on the ground, but um, th it w didn't cover the entire approach. And, um, and every responsible pilot um, needs to assume that um, he needs um, the right wind conditions, that he needs the tailwind, um, and therefore he will decline um, this angle. And lastly, in your presentation, you said that there haven't been any safety-related items. I would assume that because of the safety analysis that that was covered ahead of time, because um, we do this uh, these trials um, as part of the commercial operations, um, and um, the cockpit crews also um, weren't um, weren't particularly briefed on that. So uh, that, to me, doesn't say the whole story. It doesn't tell us the whole, the whole story. Now, of course, because of the Stena um, study, we had, um, we had excluded safety-relevant um, events. So we did not only look into 3.2, uh, but also 3.5 degrees. And for the 3.5 degree angle, the maximum vertical speed had been excess in the simulations study. Um, and um, that is why we sticked to the 3.2 degrees. That was the reason why. Um, and the other question you asked, whether in addition to the A320, we also looked at the A340 or the A330. I mean, studies like that are always limited. Um, and the data we have available um, same thing holds true for that. Uh, so we had a uh, good model data uh, for the A320 and the A330, but not for the A340. A 
I could go back just um, for illustration purposes. This also has the results for the A340 um, depicted here. And when looking at that, um, you do see that um, you have some even greater declines than for the A320. So in terms of noise levels, um, this doesn't stand out. It's not exceptional, even though um, it is more difficult in the approach and landing phase um, as it is in a heavier aircraft. I'm not sure whether I've answered your question. 